being guided. So the so-called incubation centers are very important. At this moment, you have quite some local incubation uh, centers, but spe specifically for European startups. Once you go out of your own country and you go to the US or Asia or, or even another European country, you kind of become a startup with a proven product, which you still have to re-incubate in another country. So uh, the entire incubator space is it's changing and is becoming virtual hubs of what I call incubators and, and accelerators. Um, won't go into detail about that. What can we do better or where can, where can we help? Uh, where can we do something? Because there is something happening in Europe. Uh, uh, Neely Kroos uh, talked about it. I didn't hear it, but I just saw an article on TechCrunch uh, uh, where they're saying, okay, uh, we're, Europe is rediscovering that they also can invest in, in startups and make uh, big startups. So what can we do better? I think there is a fundamental lack of respect for entrepreneurs. Um, I live half of my time in California and half of my time over here, kind of switch uh, between the two countries. And um, uh, as an anecdote, um, when I started a company here uh, two years ago uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, I got a letter from Schwarzenegger, who was a governor at that time, uh, perfect that you chose Los Angeles for, for your hub and, and please come over and I had all help I wanted. When I came here in Brussels, I had a, a letter from the tax administration that there was a problem with something on the address. So it was, it, it's a, a small anecdote, but for me it was uh, there. It was kind of the, the paved red way into being an entrepreneur and, and the, the hero culture that is allocated with it in California. And here it is, well, I do it, uh, give it your address because uh, you might be stealing something from us. So we have a fundamental issue between, with, with and we don't have to overdo it, but if you have, if we want a culture of innovation, you have to drive that culture of innovation. And it starts at universities, it starts at funds, it starts at accelerated, it starts at the government, it starts at the uni uh, European Union. If we want to have a really strong culture of innovation, we'll have to uh, recreate one. I also think that um, facilitating um, and, and accelerating the speed of internationalization is crucial. Most web startups, um, in Europe, uh, if, if uh, we have somebody from Google on the panel, and, and I was looking at uh, the, the acquisitions that Google did over the last years, about 150, I think there's four from Europe. Now, that's an issue, you know, uh, if you don't have a lot of um, acquisitions and uh, you don't have a lot of exits, the, the venture capital won't follow. So we have at this moment a quite striving entrepreneurial um, culture in Europe. You have a lot of things happening in Berlin and London and Amsterdam, everywhere, but there's a lack for seed capital and there's a lack for international success. And if all of, if, if, these, in, if these local startups want to succeed, we have to facilitate in doing easy international business. We all have fairly small markets and it's incredibly complex. Over the last two years, I've been stumbling to, to start, uh, to, to launch in various countries over Europe, it's, it's really difficult. Um, to give a, a complete other example, uh, we, I launched, uh, we launched uh, an office in, in Singapore, and in Singapore I have an account manager of the government who works for two years. He, I'll have all administrative, legislative and regulatory support for free, and I have one guy who's doing it all paid by the government. Now, uh, after two visits we started the office, now they even have a um, a seed capital program from the government where they uh, do times five the capital that you locally raise. So if you raise 100,000 euro with local capital, the government adds 400,000 to it in kind of a convertible uh, model, uh, so you don't have to do your valorization upfront. There's always a discussion in startups, how much is something worth? But you know, uh, in Singapore, they said three or four years ago, we have so many corporates here now, now we want to go for entrepreneurs, and they're really putting it to it, and I think Europe can and should do that as well. Um, we have to be born global. We have to uh, also talk about sharing experience, but I'll leave that uh, to Steve for later on. And then I think we need ambitious financing and support. Okay, there is some funding and there is some, uh, some programs, but it's not ambitious. Uh, if, if I look what happens in Silicon Valley, at some moment they choose their future winners. There's 150 YouTubes and then they choose this YouTube is going to be the winner and they have a large fund. Uh, allocated to it. Uh, I once was chairman here of, of a social network which is called Netlog. They did pretty well, one of the leading ones here in Europe. With, uh, we didn't find any real money in Belgium, so we had to go to Switzerland to find uh, 
I don't know if it's public, but uh, a couple of million, and then a couple of weeks later, uh, Facebook raised 180 million, four big funds behind it, and you know, it's game over uh, for all the social networks at that time. So we get just outspent in a lot of businesses. So if you want to do that, we have to go much more ambitious and also go much faster, especially in this in this early stage in the seed equity uh, part. And there, I think there is uh, the, the part that I started with, and if it's uh, in my own company or others, doesn't matter that much. It's the, the principle of crowdfunding. I think Europe should adopt it um, very quickly because it can, be, it can mean a difference. It goes too slowly now, but if you can do the crowdfunding in a good way, I, I think there's a, a, a huge um, uh, envy and, and huge ambition for a lot of young people and a lot of 40-year-old uh, people who, uh, who have kind of a second career um, uh, who want to start uh, crowdfunding. And, what can you do or, or where can we really use a lot of help is that pan-European crowdfunding is really tough. So until 100,000K, it's kind of similar everywhere. There's a, a directive that, that kind of coordinates it, but everything between 100,000 euro and 5 million is, has, different, has either no regulation or something different in the 30 countries, and that's really impossible. So if we really want to break through there and, and um, we need some kind of coherent regulatory framework um, so that crowdfunding for startups is well organized, is, has enough consumer protection, but has enough uh, uplift. Um, and uh, that combines the first two points. And, and um, thirdly, there's a lot of co-investment to be done. I see a lot of experiments with small and mainly creative works where the government just co-funds. There's a lot of funding initiatives. Well, if some crowdfunding project get a lot of fan support and, and some experts and they raise some money, you can just allocate and co-invest in it. And last but definitely, over definitely not least is tax incentives. Um, uh, there's a lot of tax incentives into investing into um, uh, risk domains. Uh, a lot of countries are doing it on game development. Uh, here Belgium is doing it really great in the film industry. Uh, there's a striving film industry because we have a tax shelter. UK is, is applying uh, tax incentives to uh, angel investment. If you can apply that instead of paying taxes, you can support young entrepreneurs that can make a real difference. Besides crowdfunding, uh, the incubation networks, I talked about it, and acceleration funds, which helps us to be ambitious ones that uh, startups can become one of the, the, the leading ones. So that ends my story for this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. So, um, so you have now decided to um, accept the uh, socially shunned profession of entrepreneur, um, have successfully through crowdfunded somehow managed to achieve the capital and have a fantastic idea that you want to put into practice. However, uh, from experience, I can say um, you're going to make a lot of mistakes on the way. You don't necessarily have to make all of them yourself. Um, so the way to avoid that is obviously to share knowledge. And that's what the next two speakers will be talking about. Steve, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for very, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, my name is Steve Crossan. Um, uh, I work at Google. I've worked at Google since 2005, both in Europe and the US. Uh, and I'm going to be very quick, um, partly because I can summarize most of what I wanted to say as what Bart said. Um, uh, I, I fully endorse uh, everything that Bart, Bart was saying, and it covers some of the same ground. I've been working um, uh, at Google uh, ev on everything from maps to search to Gmail, um, both in, in Europe and in the US. And in 2011, I started a group at Google called the Google Cultural Institute, um, which sounds like it we're a building on a hill somewhere and it has a fancy name, but actually we're just a group of engineers and we work on ways to give the culture sector tools to unlock the value of their digital assets. One of our projects is a project called the Google Art Project. Um, uh, in some ways, I described it earlier to Bart as we're trying to bring big data to the world of culture and, 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 to, and to see what happens. So the subject today is dear to my heart, not only because um, open data and open content are very live subjects in the cultural sector, um, and we place ourselves very much within that movement, but also because prior to Google, my whole working life was spent as a sometimes struggling European tech entrepreneur, um, including as a supplier of open source software solutions to the public sector. Um, uh, and uh, so I want to give a personal perspective on this question based on my experience, um, uh, both at Google and as an entrepreneur. Um, so I doubt there's anyone here who dispute our starting point, uh, which is that 
you know, the, ever, the revolution, the, the internet has absolutely revolutionized um, commerce and entrepreneurship. Um, there's a recent McKinsey study which estimates that you know, in European growth and in mature, com uh, uh, mature economies generally, 21% 20 of the growth in the last five years um, is down to, uh, to em uh, embrace of the internet. And in particular, the SMEs um, tend to grow twice as fast if, when they adopt the, the internet. Um, and I think that the, you know, there is, uh, on a positive note, the internet remains a f powerful force for lowering, bar lowering barriers to entry um, and thus for stimulating competition. And we shouldn't forget that. Um, as a graduate student in the 90s, I remember the incredible experience of suddenly being able to access all of this scholarly information on the web for the first time without having to go to a library or a museum, something which we kind of take for granted now because we've all been living with it for a very long time. But actually, it's a very profound change um, in human society and um, is still with us. And to echo something from the previous um, session, you know, there is a lot of, there's always some forward and some back. There's always openness and then there's, there's, there are steps backwards, whether it's steps backwards from, for corporate reasons or for governmental reasons or, or whatever the reasons. But the general trend, I think, is that the genie is out of the bottle and, you know, openness is, is clearly the future. Um, and uh, open access to information in particular, whether educational, cultural or commercial, is an incredible stimulant to human activity and achievement. So what... What, what about the role of, um, uh, of, of government um, and, and the role of regulation? Um, what, what can we do? So the, the first thing I would say from, at a European level is to talk about um, implementation of the services directive. Um, uh, we've already seen, um, through the open market, massive stimulation of cross-border trade. We have a generation, probably two generations now, of students um, who've been brought up going to school in one country, undergraduate in another country, and postgraduate in a third country, you see themselves as the Europeans. Many of these people are now our generation of entrepreneurs. There is absolutely no lack of entrepreneurship in Europe um, uh, at, at, at that level, in, you know, in London, Berlin, Paris, Amsterdam, but also in many, many smaller hubs around Europe. I myself started up a, uh, a company in Brighton, England, where there's a big um, tech hub there, just in a, in a relatively small town. Um, and, you know, five years ago, I might have said that the, 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 the barrier to turning those entrepreneurs into world beaters was finance. Um, and it's true that there's still somewhere to go. And I definitely echo what Bart said about making big, big bets. But there has been a lot of movement in, fi in finance in the last five years. And the situation is a lot better than it was five years ago, not least because of innovations um, such as Bart's. Um, and, uh, but what I would... Uh, the, the, the one thing that I always see, and I know that I was guilty of my, this of myself as an entrepreneur, is that there's always a temptation to settle for survival. To say, okay, I've got my business, I know what to do, um, I'm regional, I have moderate success, I'm going to settle survival for survival. Or for being you know, bought by a national